Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to come out and speak with you today. What I'm hoping to do today is give you an overview of some of the different ways that big data is impacting the national security realm. And the organization that I'm a part of is part of Johns Hopkins University. It's called the Applied Physics Lab, and it's what the Defense Department refers to as a university-affiliated research center. So big picture, there's lots of them around the world. There's probably about two or three dozen in the U.S., but the goal of our organization organizations is to first and foremost understand what it is that the operational users are trying to do, whether it's people in the Air Force, people in the Navy, people in the intelligence community, really get close to them to understand the problems that they're facing, and then take a step into academia, into the advanced development community like this, to both be able to communicate those problems to these sort of venues so that we can explain the challenges we're facing, but also, as, I, as we identify new and promising technologies, figure out how you can bring those forward first into some sort of prototype where you can say, boy, this is working great at LinkedIn. Is this something that would work in a defense setting? And if it is, how do you help the government get into a position where it can actually build the innovative solutions from the commercial sector into the national security sector? So true to the uh, write-up that I had put, Here's the outline of what I'm going to do today. So first and foremost, I'm going to give an overview of what is a national security environment and what are the different kinds of challenges that big data is posing in that environment. Secondly, we're going to look a little bit about what's maybe unique. So what are some challenges that you run into in the national security world that you wouldn't necessarily run into if you had a commercial product? Then we're going to talk a little bit about both what the government is doing and what the government is currently looking for as far as solicitations in this area. So, if we were approaching a company, if we were a startup, we wanted to go and sell our product, we would first figure out what's the business strategy of the customers that we're going to go try to sell to, what's the organization, or what are the organizations in that market space, and then what are the kinds of people that are in that company? Do I want to go for the VP of sales? Do I want to go for a chief operating officer, et cetera? When you think about the national security realm, what we're going to do real fast is walk through what's our business strategy, so what is the national security strategy of the country, Second thing is who are the organizations that are involved, and then the third are who are the different players within those organizations. So the country as a whole ha always has a national security strategy published. Uh, you can go online at the White House, I've got the URL in the brief that you can look at it, but you can Google it. And it's a document that describes a couple things. So first and foremost it says this is what we as a country are trying to do, and so you see up here where it talks about our interests. We're in the game for security, prosperity, we like the values that we have and we'd like to share them, and then we're also uh, in the game to try to foster an international order that favors the development of the things that we want. The document goes on to say, well, we've got a lot of different levers as a country that we could use. We've got economic power, we've got diplomatic power, we can do development. We've also got defense, intelligence, homeland security, et cetera. And so it lays out these are the different mechanisms that we have our, at our disposal. And then the rest of the document actually goes into great detail talking about specific things that we're trying to do. And so these are what we refer to as the national security missions. And so if you look at the various national security missions that are called out in the documents, they're rank ordered constantly by saying, these are the things that we as a country are worried about happening that would impact our interests and this is what we're going to do in order to keep these from happening. The examples here, conventional military is probably the one you think about the most if you think about these things at all, which is how are we going to take our military and employ it in different parts of the world to uh, make sure that we're protecting our people and our interests. And then when you go down the list, the rest of these are ones that you might have seen in various plots of Hollywood movies. So counter-nuclear proliferation is twofold. One is for the people who have nuclear weapons in the world, what can we do to work with them to make them secure, reduce them, and to keep them from falling into the hands of terrorists? And then in the latter category, counterproliferation, if somebody has the technique to build a nuclear weapon, how do we make sure that they're not telling other people how to do it so that we can generally try to keep the number of nuclear capable countries in the world down? Counter chemical and biological warfare, how do we figure out if somebody is out there trying to do us harm using either a chemical or a biological agent? How do we detect that they're doing it? How do we figure out what their intent is? And then how do we stop them before they can do grave damage? Counterterrorism, cybersecurity, the rest of these are hopefully ones that you are familiar with. Again, if nothing else, Hollywood does a pretty good job of trying to paint them into the conscience of the country. 
But they're all examples of the kinds of things that the government's trying to do. Now, when you look at the defense establishment or the national security establishment, it's massive. And so it's hard to get your head around just how many organizations and people there are. The reason I put some up on this slide is that there's probably a good 20 or 30 different organizations that would be inside the national security realm, some of which you've heard of, some of which you probably haven't. I focused here on three of the legs of power, defense, intelligence, and homeland security, just because that's largely the, the realms that I work in. There's lots going on with State Department for diplomacy, for USAID for development. There's other levers that the country uses to accomplish national security. But here the kind of players organizationally that you'll deal with is for defense, it's primarily the Pentagon, which is the Department of Defense, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps. When you look at Homeland Security, it's primarily going to be the Department of Homeland Security when it comes to the broad protect mission, and then also the FBI when it comes to the intersection of protection and law enforcement. In the lower left for intelligence, you've got the Director of National Intelligence as the community manager for the intelligence community. There's 16 different agencies in there, which includes some defense agencies, some Homeland Security, uh, and CIA is the one that most people know of and think of in that realm. So, if there's a national security market space, these are the organizations. And then the problem again is that if you went to a commercial company, you'd know that you're looking probably for a CEO and maybe a COO and maybe there'd be a VP of marketing and there'd be product managers. So one of the questions that you have when you approach big data and national security is to say, well, first of all, who are the people in these national security organizations and where would the big data challenges likely reside? So, Org chart-wise up top, and I won't go into it, but the Defense Department being good at scaling things organizationally really large has come out with a numbering system where they basically say instead of VP of this and VP of that and VP of this, we're going to number the basic jobs one to eight. So the, the J1 in this person, or if you were in the Army, it would be the G1 or the Navy, the N1, is the person who just deals with personnel and manpower. The two is the person who deals with intelligence. The three is the person who deals with operations. The five here is the person who deals with planning, et cetera. So the good news is these give you a sense immediately of who are the people that you might be intersecting with. And when you think about big data, I've pulled out three of them here at the bottom. These are the people who most acutely today are feeling the, the pain of big data and are looking for solutions. So on the left, the intelligence uh, organizations these are people who either are doing strategic or tactical intelligence. So strategic is you're trying to figure out big picture what might be happening next in the world. Who are the adversaries that uh, want to do us harm? What are they capable of? What are their intentions? And you're trying to answer those questions continuously using lots of information. The process that I've laid out here, the requirements, planning, collection, etc. Again, the good thing about the uh, Department of Defense or a lot of the government having to scale rapidly over time and continuously train people is that things are pretty well documented. So you can actually go online and read the joint pub for each of these, which is a 100-page how-to manual that says, if you're a J2, here is all the things that you should be doing, here's how you should do your job, et cetera, for the operations and planning as well. The cycle here, though, requirements, planning, collection, processing, exploitation, this is the way the community thinks about going from a question that a policymaker might have, like, is organization whatever trying to do us harm, to figuring out how would we get that data? If we got that data, how would we process it so that we could analyze it? If we analyze it, we're going to write a report. Who do we need to re report? And then what questions are left unanswered that start the cycle again? We're going to spend a lot of our time today in that realm. But I did want to mention these other two to you. The intelligence organizations are constantly asking what if, but they're not necessarily saying, and what would you do about it? So the planning organizations, their job is to constantly be saying, hmm, if bad guy organization whatever did get a nuke and tried to bring it into the country and, and detonate it, what would we do? Would we stop them at the border? Would we stop them outside of the country? Would we try to find a way to make the nuke not go off? The planners are the people who are constantly doing modeling and simulation and wargaming to figure out what are all the things that could go wrong what are the different options that we have? So they speak in terms of courses of action. And then what are the pros and cons of each of these courses of action? So they're taking the intelligence products, they're thinking about what might happen in the world, and they're actually developing uh, plans that sit on the shelves and they say, okay, well, if that were to happen, we've wargamed it a bunch of times, and this is how we think you would want to play it out. 
And those plans sit on the shelves until you see in real world, ah, we have indication that bad guy organization, whatever, does now have a nuclear weapon. Let's pull out the plan and let's start working from that plan. And that's where the operational world is working through all of that. So quick introduction of who's who in the community. We talked a little bit about this, which is the intelligence cycle. The reason I highlight it here is that when you think about the data, this is really where a lot of the data problems come in first and foremost, which is how do you take this massive data that we're getting from all of our sensors and get it to the point that you've got an intelligent product that a decision maker can use to make a decision. So flavors of data. When you talk to people in the defense and intelligence world about what are the kinds of data that you deal with, these are the six basic types, what they're often referred to as the intelligence disciplines. But think of them as trade unions in the data sense. You can find people who worry about signals intelligence. So these are things that we've intercepted that are some sort of communications mode. Image intelligence, which is some sort of photograph or image, uh, either from satellite or from an aircraft. Mazin, this is one you might not have heard of. So these are the maybe chemical signature, biological signature. They're things that are derived from other analysis, but they themselves create a, a large volume of data. There's open source intelligence, which is the intelligence and defense communities using uh, the authorities that they can to actually scan and monitor documents, let's say foreign television or newspaper. Human intelligence is the one you think of people exchanging briefcases of information or uh, covert action where you've got different people as spies in different country. It also involves a lot of other uh, people, informants for example in the FBI context would be in this category. And then geospatial intelligence is a lot of that as it pertains, specific, specifically the images as it pertains to the earth, understanding and mapping the earth. Each of these has a community manager who's responsible for all this data. Each of these has umpteen different systems that are pumping out new and better ways to get the data. So within the imagery world, there's a series of people who are constantly saying, what collection method would get me more images, more data? And the community manager for each of these, which is itself an agency, so for example, the NSA, the National Security Agency, is designated as the SIGINT community manager. They're the ones who figure out how do we get all the information, how do we store it, how do we process it, and how do we make it accessible so that just because I've collected it over here, I've now got an analyst over here who needs access to it. So let me walk through an example of how this has happened, where we are today with one uh, particular thread and then where we're going in the future and I think you'll get a clearer sense of just exactly how the big data challenges are going to hit us. So aerial reconnaissance. For a lot of reasons if you're in an operational setting you might want to have pictures real time of what's going on on the ground. So in World War II you might have used it to either figure out is that a production facility or a factory, is there a bridge somewhere, what are they doing with their troops, what do we know about how well our last bombing raid worked or not. And so the way we did it is we loaded cameras onto aircraft. We took very daring pilots who flew low to the ground over enemy territory, generally without guns, took pictures with those cameras on that aircraft, flew back. We developed the film in dark rooms. We got some small, relatively small number of photos. People then looked at them with magnifying glasses and 3D scopes to try to figure out what's going on. And then they annotated pictures and disseminated that to commanders. That was the way that aerial reconnaissance was done. And if you imagine the data rates, you're talking about per plane, you know, dozens of pictures, a production timeline that took the time of unloading the film, developing the film, analyzing it, producing it, et cetera. So not particularly high data rate or particularly high um, speed. Things stayed the same for largely 50 years in the end of the uh, 20th century where what we were doing was improving from analog to digital photography, improving the overflight of aircraft, etc. And then around 2000 at the beginning of the war in Iraq, you saw the introduction of what are referred to as the remotely piloted aircraft, also known as drones, Predator, Global Hawk, Reaper are some of the, the brand names of the systems. What these are capable of doing is looping over a battlefield. So picture Afghanistan or Iraq. You will have these at any given point. There's probably 50 of these in the air right now. They're 
20 hour loiter time and they've got on it a turret that's got a series of cameras as you can see on the left, infrared, color, etc. And those cameras are able to send down real time a continuous video feed of what's going on on the ground. So now you've got far more data, 20 hours instead of one mission, 30 frames per second instead of uh, a roll of film. You've also got the ability that a sensor operator can sit uh, in the ground, usually not necessarily in the, well, sometimes in the same country, sometimes actually operating from the US, but they can drive that sensor around to figure out what they want to look at, and then what they can do is actually communicate real time with the person on ground. Much higher data volumes, much shorter timelines. Now, this is already posing a significant challenge for the Department of Defense in the sense that they don't have enough of these analysts in the middle. It takes two or three shifts of people for one operation with the uh, platform in the air. And then even then, the person who's watching the video as it goes by might be watching just for what that operational group on the ground needs them to look for. But now we're talking about archiving all of the video and trying to figure out, well, maybe there was something of intelligence value that you collected that we aren't even going to know we're going to need for a year or two years when somebody goes back and says, do we have any pictures of that neighborhood? So DOD has been trying to figure out, how do you build an architecture that lets you capture all of this? As an example, in 2009, they there was about 24 years worth of video if you had watched it end to end that was captured and were increasing at about a rate of uh, 30 times every other year. So if that data problem is not enough, the next generation of sensors that are being developed right now by Air Force and DARPA is to actually take the Predator and move it one step beyond. So now what we're talking about is what's referred to as wide area area surveillance. So imagine putting up either a uh, blimp, an airship, or one of these drones, but instead of a single turret th where you can point to different objects on the ground and watch them, imagine putting 12 or 50 cameras, each of which are going to be taking a picture below them at 2 or 30 frames per second, depending on the development timeline. And you're looking now at a constant stare over an area of 4 to 10 miles. So you're talking now about a massive quantity of data that's not obviously able to be looked at by one analyst. And so what DOD's been trying to figure out is how do you deal with this problem? Sensors, they're on track. They're going to deliver. We're going to be able to capture the data. There'll be data link problems as far as how do you pump that much data down in remote environments. But as you can see here, you've got far more data in the top row. But the bottom line is that you don't have more analysts. And this is where what the Defense Department has recognized is that we need to have a much better strategy for using this data. Now, the aerial reconnaissance example that I gave is just a single example of a thread where big data might hit national security. Some of the other ones that we deal with a lot, cybersecurity, Department of Defense alone has about 7 million devices attached to about 15,000 different networks. And again, the NSA, the Director of Cyber Command, is trying to figure out how do you protect that when you're talking about many terabytes per second of data going in and out of those network boundaries. It is unknown at this point how you could design architectures that are fast enough to work in real time that are going to give you the levels of protection that you want. Money laundering, that by the way is what $2 million in cash, or $200 million in cash would look like if you ever have the opportunity in your life to uh, stack it up. You can figure out how large of a room you'll need to put your $2 million, $200 million in cash. Money laundering is a huge problem though. Most of the nefarious activities in the US, whether it's terrorism or uh, narcotics, have to do with somehow getting a product in and then having a flow of money that goes back from the known good part of the world through various financial channels into known bad parts of the world. So there's a lot of challenge in how do you figure out in the transaction data of financial transactions which things might be indicators of nefarious activity. Space situational awareness here in the bottom, when we're looking at more and more use of space, we've got a lot of junk up there. It's not getting better and we've got to figure out ways to both track everything that's going on in space with all the, the uh, various satellites and satellite debris so that we can plan and manage our missions around it. And then another Homeland Security challenge here, containers. When you think about the amount of container shipments going in and out of the United States, a huge problem is trying to figure out how do you stop, whether it's human smuggling, whether it's smuggling of weapons, whether it's smuggling of drugs, or in the worst case, uh, again, a weapon of mass destruction. 
how do you get targeting systems that can help you figure out in that massive stream of containers going back and forth, which are the ones that you'd want to isolate? So another, uh, this is the Matryoshka doll part of the talk. A good description of how does big data hit CIA in specific uh, is actually online. There's a great talk that was given about two months ago by Gus Hunt, who's the chief technology officer of the CIA. And he's got a, a broad view where he looks specifically at these are the ways that it's impacting the CIA and here's what they're doing uh, for their architecture to get ready. Now, big picture. The good news is that even though we're seeing all of these national security challenges show up, it's been recognized by the White House, by the Office of Science and Tech Policy, that this is an issue that's significant and that it's cross-cutting. So what the White House has done is not only acknowledge the issue, but then just a couple months ago launched the Big Data Research and uh, Development Initiative. And I know some of the speakers later today were actually at this kickoff. But the idea when you think about the government recognizing a problem is first that they acknowledge it. So we've, we've seen it, we've written a paper, we've said, yep, big data is gonna be a problem. The second thing that they can do is put money where their mouth is. And so this is the case where DOD is already spending on the order of $250 million a year before this announcement on things related to big data. The press release here actually lists about 80 ongoing programs across the government that are doing different uh, attempts to either do research or advanced development with uh, large data systems. What this is going to do is it's going to focus the nation's research enterprise, so NSF, NIH, uh, the services, DARPA, to figure out what are the different investments that we need to make in order to improve the nation's investment or capabilities for big data. One of the things, there's two major programs that I was going to talk about in the context today, although there were a variety of other ones that were mentioned. I, I introduced you briefly before this DOD program, the Data to Decisions program. As you can see, what Data to Decisions is trying to do is figure out within the context of DOD, how are we going to deal with all the sensor data that we're getting? And then how are we going to make it so that we can actually afford to buy, use, and, and integrate this? Two things that I want to highlight when you look at their uh, uses. So down here, well, I'll start up here. They're approaching the problem as a layered architecture and generally saying at the beginning, the data layer is pretty well taken care of by industry. Industry is bl blazing forward with how do you manage massive quantities of data. It would not necessarily be useful for the government to uh, intervene. What the government's going to do is be a fast follower here. Similarly, in the user interface layer, no sense for the government to get involved with significant investment if this is already going to be something that's commercially viable. The bit that should be music to many of your ears, what is immature are the analytics that are specifically looking at the kinds of data that are needed for the Defense Department and the kinds of data that are needed for defense missions. So that's where a lot of the emphasis of the program is going to be. And then buried in here are two interesting things that again are, are exciting I think in a research stand. One is that traditionally when they've tried to do these things in the past, you get into a standoff where defense says, boy, we really have a problem with our super secret satellite system. And the research community says, well, just give us some of your data and we'll analyze it with our algorithms and see what we can do. And then the defense department says, well, we actually can't give you any of our data because it's super secret and thus stops a lot of good progress. So one of the commitments that the Defense Department's making here is that they're actually going to get representative samples of data with ground truth out to the research community so that you're going to be able to actually test, develop algorithms, and figure out are these things that are tractable with known methods. So if DOD delivers on that, which is actually getting out the data so that you can manipulate and analyze it, that would be a huge win for the Defense Department really finding a way to reach out to this broader community. The second thing here, when they talk about the open source service-oriented architecture paradigm, a lot of times when defense makes an investment, somebody develops an awesome algorithm, and then they say, oh, but wait, to show it to you, I need a visualization layer, and then I also need data, and then I also need to go ahead and have a networking layer. And before you know it, each research team has developed, even though they wanted to focus on the algorithms, they've been forced to develop the rest of the system so that they can demonstrate what they've done. 
What DOD is going to be trying to do in this program is come to a, a consensus on what should be an open architecture so the people who want to focus on algorithms can do so, people who want to focus on visualization can do so, and not have to rebuild each other's work. So as an example here, and I'll, I'll let you read this, the way that a lot of these challenge problems are being framed by the Defense Department is that they'll specify a problem and then they'll say, here are the kinds of things we want to go after in the next three to five years, and then here are the kinds of things that we'd go after in the next seven to ten years. So just in the thread of analytics, this is a good example of what they're going after. More broadly, what you can see when, when you look at this full brief online is that they actually have timelines where notionally they're saying, we expect to put some sort of research call for this type of work in this time frame. So these are the documents that feed the budget process for defense. Now a second effort, very closely related, but from a different funding source, is DARPA, is the Defense, Adven Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Their goal is to do high risk, high payoff research where they're taking things that are further afield if the DOD enterprise that I was just showing you is taking things that are much closer to being ready and being mature to being deployed, DARPA is supposed to be on the edgier front. So they've recently launched a program called XData that's the same question, which is what are we going to do to compute over the massive volumes of data that we have and what are we going to do in order to find a way to both have scalable algorithms and also efficient human computer interaction tools so that as we get these systems we can figure out if they're going to work or not at all. The X data call is open now. It, this might be something that some of you have been involved in trying to answer. But it's yet another good example where the government's acknowledged it. They're going to put research monies towards it. The challenge is DARPA will pick people, they will develop awesome algorithms, and then what we've got to do is figure out how do you actually get those into practice. And so we speak a lot of times as far as the valley of death or valleys of death, which is you get a really great research prototype, people, you know, the three-star general comes from the field and says, that's awesome, I want that tomorrow in my, in my theater of operations. And that's when you realize that there is no viable path to go from this prototype into any sort of deployed system that's certified and accredited, et cetera. So, uh, separate issue to address lately, later, but it actually brings me to the final point that I want to go through, which is what can go wrong? So in the commercial world, and DJ did a great job of talking about a lot of the ways that you can both quickly build product, show them to people, and then push them out in orders of magnitude days. The government does not work orders of magnitude days. On a good, on a good time, we're orders of magnitude weeks. But here's just a quick series of some of the, the things that might go wrong. I put these out not to be a downer at the end of the talk. I put these out just because this is the reality of, of the operational world that we're in. So first thing that's odd to many of you, the way the federal government budget works, you have to specify now. So today, the departments that I work for asking the question, what are we going to buy in fiscal year 14? So they're having to write paragraphs saying, in October of 2013, I plan to spend money on the following things. That's, what, two iPhone generations away, three iPhone generations away. It's comical in an IT world to be living in a budget environment like this, but it's the reality of where we are. So there's a lot of machinations trying to figure out how does the government get more agile when it comes to doing investments. The second one, and if you've not seen this chart, this is, the actual chart taught by the Defense Acquisition University on how the government buys things. So it's called the Integrated Defense Acquisition Technology Lifecycle. Starts in the upper left where you say, well, do we have a need? You know, I need to be able to see through buildings. And it goes through a whole process of figuring out how do you do it. The only thing I want to highlight here is that you can imagine in an agile IT world, this is totally wrong. And again, while we understand that it's wrong and that it doesn't work, the government keeps getting into problems where they buy things, they blow a billion dollars, there's a congressional hearing, they say, boy, we need to go back and make sure that we're following these plans. And so we're caught in a do loop right now where there's great dissatisfaction with this for IT systems, but there's not the legal flexibility to get around it. Next thing is siloed systems. Generally, the government buys things that are chains that go from sensor to storage to processing to users, and they have a union of users who are ready to, to use that data stream. 
And you could think of the defense intelligent establishment as thousands of those chains. And so if you were used to looking at a particular radar type or a particular sensor type, you got that data, you wrote your report about what you're seeing in your sensor type. When you're talking about big data, what we want to do is go horizontally across all these silos and really unlock the power of pulling the data together. The problem you quickly run into, though, is this, which is that we don't have a unified cloud of data. Instead, what you actually have in the defense world is there's classification, so you've got top secret, secret, and unclassified. You might have some things in the, that are coalition, so maybe I'm operating in another country with Afghanistan and I've got some data I can share with them, but I have other data that's U.S. persons are not able to be shared with foreign persons. The SCI is uh, sensitive compartmentalized information. Maybe I've got on the FBI and I have somebody who's an undercover agent in a gang and if anyone found out that he was undercover, he'd get killed. So I'm going to keep this super tight. Uh, you know, it's only going to be written on paper and it's only going to be in a room. And then finally, the U.S. persons. The country takes extraordinarily seriously its obligation to protect U.S. persons' privacy. And so any data set that we think might have U.S. persons in it gets treated extremely sensitively. The only people who can see it are people who are authorized to see it. They have to have the right sort of training. You have to uh, expunge U.S. persons if you see them. You have to get them out of your data systems. There's a lot of rules and a lot of energy that goes into removing this. This is an interesting area, though, where a lot of the commercial solutions, because they're not under the same Privacy Act constraints about use or reuse of personnel information, don't necessarily have the hooks built in out of the box to do the sort of uh, detailed control of data access that it's going to take to do some of the federal government challenges. For those of you in the Hadoop world, uh, you'll notice that NSA came out with a tweak of the big table implementation that they call a Cumulo. The big driver for Accumulo in the Apache world was to get this. So they built iterators on top of the boxes that would allow them to do detailed control over who can see what. Final two points. Number one is that in addition to all the various lags, we are still generally fighting the last war. And when it comes to a personnel system, when you think about what do we need as a, a country going forward, it's probably that we need many more data scientists and it's also true that it's going to be a long time before our training systems, our training pipelines, and our recruiting wakes up to that. So we're going to keep hiring the flavors of people that we have been. And then finally, we're all used to being in this world connected to high bandwidth connections, always on the internet, right? It's even now on aircraft, you can, at least with some regularity, get a Wi-Fi signal. A lot of the places where people are going to want to consume this big data are going to be at the end of very thin pipes, right? There's no cell phone towers in the uh, desert picture on the left, or in intermittent IP environments where you're going to literally disappear for a while and then come back in and need to do bulk sync. So they're just different data challenges that challenge some of the assumptions that a lot of our commercial enterprises have been built on because you can presume high bandwidth and continuous connectivity. So that's the overview that I got. Happy to talk to folks uh, later if you want more specifics on any of the given problems. But again, I think it's a bright future for folks who are interested in applying the big data challenges to national security. Thank you.